Hello everyone, this is Rohan Meshram and in our previous lecture, we concluded our discussion uh, with uh, the agreement that the genetic distance cannot be observed directly and therefore statistical techniques are necessary to infer this genetic distance from the sequence data. Well now, in today's lecture, we will deal with various evolutionary models that are proposed to uh, calculate that evolutionary distance. Okay, so uh, it is to be uh, it is to be noted from our previous lecture uh, that there is difference between what we call it as the observed distance. from what is uh, what we call it as the genetic distance or evolutionary distance in phylogenetic analysis what we need is genetic distance and uh, this observed distance is uh, simply not enough for evolutionary analysis well, the dendrogram that you observe while you perform multiple sequence alignment by cluster are simply constructed by clustering observed distances and hence they should not be confused with the phylogram that are built on genetic distances. Both the trees although look like phylogenetic tree but they are completely different. So, in summary, MSA or what we call it as multiple sequence alignment will yield dendrogram or what we call it as guide tree and this dendrogram and guide tree is not the phylogenetic tree. For constructing a phylogenetic tree, you need evolutionary data and dendrogram do not use evolutionary data in their tree reconstructions. They are simply built on observed distances or the p-value. So in short, what we get in MSA is the p-value or the observed distance and our objective now in this lecture is to estimate the d-value or the evolutionary distance that correspond to the actual genetic distance that uh, might have happened in the long due course of evolution. For doing this, various research group and scientists have proposed something called as evolutionary models. So, evolutionary model will help us obtain the actual genetic distance from the sequence data that we have. Well, now, these evolutionary models, well say for example, we would deal with evolutionary models like Jukes and Cantor model, Kimura 2 parameter model, Felsenstein 81 model and many more that are coming uh, up in the uh, following discussion. Well, all of these evolutionary model are based on certain assumption on how sequence might have changed. Therefore, each evolutionary model is based on their own assumption on how substitution might have happened in the sequence. Generally, based on these assumptions, people built up mathematical terms and this mathematical term help infer a relationship between observed and expected evolutionary distance. So, this is how uh, generally things happen that uh, when you when anyone built uh, tries to build up this evolutionary model they begin with some assumptions and based on these assumptions they generate mathematical framework and based on this mathematical framework they then calculate evolutionary distance Okay, then again, these 
things can also be re uh, repeated like once you calculate the evolutionary distance then you can make another assumption then uh, you can modify the mathematical framework and then again calculate the revised evolutionary uh, distances as such okay so uh, you know uh, this cycle goes round and round and each and every time we come up with a better evolutionary model right so uh, now let us begin with the uh, simplest uh, uh, simplest model what uh, we uh, call it as the jukes cantor model that was proposed in 1969 and hence we call it as gc69 model so this jukes and cantor began with the simplest assumption that their first assumption you can let, let me write it down that the first assumption is that all mutations that happen in the DNA sequence, all mutation rates are equal. So all mutations that happen in any DNA sequence might happen at a uh, equal rate. That is, if you have got, uh, that is, if you have got any nucleotide sequence, then the rate of A getting substituted by T will be the same as that of G and C. So such mutations are happening at the same rate. These mutations can happen at same rate and people uh, refer this rate as alpha. By saying this, by denoting alpha, we can say that alpha is the rate at which such mutations can happen. A can uh, be replaced by T at the same rate, A can also be replaced by G at the same rate, A can also be replaced by C. So this is the first assumption. Now the second assumption uh, that these uh, people uh, made is that all nucleotides can show up in the sequence with equal frequency. Well, this means that every nucleotide have equal chance of occurrence in the sequence. We have four nucleotides, right? We have four nucleotides. These are A, T, G and C. So, since we have four nucleotide and thus uh, we have 25 percent chances of each of these nucleotide to occur at any position in your DNA. We say that all possibilities of substitution, all possibilities of substitution must sum up to 1. Okay. And therefore, every nucleotide must occur at the frequency of at the frequency of 0 0.25. Then and then everything would sum up to 1. All the four uh, nucleotide possibility would sum up to 1. Right? But this assumption may not be very realistic because over here, if we uh, keep on, uh, I mean, if we uh, if we believe this assumption, then there is no space to consider chemical nature like purine to purine or purine to pyrimidine uh, substitution in this model. But anyways, this being the simplest one, let us start out building the model based on these two simple assumptions as uh, it was built up by Jukes and Kenter. Okay. So, uh, now this is how scientists model the situation by using these uh, two assumptions. Uh, I would just uh, show you a brief account as to how such assumptions can be mathematically modeled. So, what we have is that we have four uh, nucleotide and uh, if we have four nucleotide, then we can arrange them in a four by four matrix. 
okay so uh, the resulting 4 by 4 matrix is sometime called as the relative rate matrix or some people refer it to as transition rate matrix or it is also referred to as the Q matrix right so uh, in this way what we have is that we have four nucleotides okay uh, you can denote them as a c g and t and at the same time you can uh, name or well say for example you can write them in the same order on the column side as well g and t so whatever resulting 4 by 4 matrix that you get we call it as the relative rate matrix transition rate matrix or the q matrix right so the 12 value that might end up expect except this diagonal that would correspond to transition that might have occur by substitution that is transition between a and c transition between a and g and transition between a and t and so on we have already defined that all transition this a to c transition a to g transition and a to t, uh, a to t transition these might happen at the equal rate when it comes to jukes and cantor model that was proposed in 1969 so let us denote these transition as alpha so a to c transition can be denoted by alpha a to g transition can be denoted by alpha a to t transition can also be denoted by alpha right so in short we have got three alphas this is first alpha second alpha and third alpha right so the chances of remaining is for a that is 1 minus 3 alpha right therefore all the diagonal value in a transition matrix will be 1 minus 3 alpha 1 minus 3 alpha for c to c 1 minus 3 alpha for g to g and 1 minus 3 alpha for t to t okay and the remaining transition we would denote the remaining transition we would simply denote as alpha same would be the case over here right So, in uh, this way, okay. So, in uh, this way, what we have generated right now is a relative transition matrix. Okay, so all these 12 value 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay, all of this 12 value in the matrix would correspond to the transition that occur by substitution. And 1 minus 3 alpha is the remaining uh, chances of uh, having such transitions. Okay, so now next what we have to do next what we have to do is to derive a probability matrix given this transition matrix so uh, let me draw this uh, transition matrix for you we would uh, uh, we would let me let me just derive it we have these four nucleotides a g c and t again we have the same one over here a g c and t okay we can simply have minus 3 alpha at all diagonal positions and we can have alpha 
at every line uh, at every non diagonal position okay so this is what we have so from this uh, tran uh, this transition matrix what we have to do is to derive a probability matrix uh, probability matrix we need to derive some another matrix called as the probability matrix the point of deriving this probability matrix or the point of uh, the point of doing this is that we need to figure out as to how is that we correlate how is that we correlate uh, this transition with respect to time therefore deriving substitution probability matrix gives you the probability of any nucleotide to change into any another nucleotide for a specified time interval okay so what we are supposed to do is to generate something called as the probability matrix so that is what we have here what we have is something called as the transition matrix and what we have to generate is something called as the probability matrix so in this matrix you can have probability of a with a probability of a getting uh, uh, getting substituted by c probability of p getting substitute a getting uh, substituted by g probability of a getting substituted by t right similarly uh, in the next column we have probability of c and a probability of c and c probability of c and g probability of c and t next we have probability of g and a probability of g and c probability of g and g probability of g and t and finally in the final row you can have probability of t and a probability of t and c probability of t and g and probability of t and t okay so let me uh, tell you this thing once more <coughs> we need to generate this probability matrix from transition matrix so that we can convert this transition rate matrix to time okay it will be like uh, it will be like saying that if i wait for say 10 million years then there is some probability that a will change to c or if i wait for some uh, another time interval say for 100 million years then there would be a different probability for the same thing so in this way we need to have a correlation of the transition rate matrix with the time and hence we generate this probability matrix so uh, this probability matrix is thus a function of time so now uh, this can be done mathematically you can transform the transition rate matrix into the probability rate matrix if you have probability function p of t for 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 transforming your transition rate matrix into probability matrix all you need to have is a probability function that is denoted by p of t so this p of t is again an exponent function of e raised to q t okay and this exponent function involves the transition q and the given time interval t i will not go into details of this but at uh, but for time being just understand that we can mathematically transform this transition matrix into uh, into probability matrix right so this is what we have is called as probability matrix and this probability matrix is a function of time okay and here what we have is relative rate matrix this relative rate matrix can be converted into uh, probability matrix which is a function of time by using something called as the uh, probability function 
this is called as this is called as probability function which is again an exponent function that involves transition that might happen in your relative rate matrix with the time that we have considered okay so uh, this is all it is basically all of this mathematical framework boiled down to a simple expression that jukes and cantor derived that relates the evolutionary distance that we calculate over here d with the observed distance that you might have obtained from the relative rate matrix that is d and how is that uh, these people uh, how is that these jukes and cantor uh, made the relationship between the p matrix and p values and d values that they have used all of this mathematical function and derived a simple expression that gives you the relationship between the genetic distance d and the observed distance p and this relationship is simply as d is equal to minus 3 by 4 log of 1 minus 4 by 3 okay so now using this simple equation one can correlate your uh, p value to the original genetic distance something called it, uh, something what we call it as d value so now if you uh, give very keen attention you would realize that this jukes and cantor model entirely depend on a single factor what we call it as the rate of transition alpha we often call this this deciding factor as parameter parameter of evolutionary model therefore since jc69 model is based on a single parameter alpha we can refer this jukes and cantor model as a single parameter model so practically we can use the formula that is derived by Jukes and Cantor to estimate the evolutionary distance from the observed distance that we obtain uh, that we can obtain from just comparing the sequences. Now, in order to derive this evolutionary distance using JC69 evolutionary model, one just have to plug in the observed p value in this equation. And the expected evolutionary distance d can be easily calculating by simply multiplying the observed distance by 4 by 3, subtract it from 1, take it uh, take its log and divide it by minus, four, uh, minus 3 by 4. There you go. You have genetic distance from observed distance. Well, uh, uh, well this is you can say an over simplified explanation of uh, what exactly happens in Jukes and Cantor model. Okay, so this was all about this uh, Jukes and Cantor model. Well, now, uh, now is the good time that we again go back to the graph where I have shown you what is the, what is the relationship between the D and P e values. Okay, so now this particular graph is obtained using the Jukes Cantor model d is equal to minus 3 by 4 log of 1 minus 4 by 3 p okay so now this model is built in such a way that uh, that you know uh, uh, the uh, the the characteristic of this graph is completely based on the way this model has been built up right so uh, this uh, this uh, this terminology or you can say the ideology that is applied in this model uh, don't allow the uh, don't allow the saturation rate to cross above uh, you can say 0.7 or you can say the p values will never cross 0.7 because it is based on this evolutionary assumption or based on uh, this evolutionary model.
okay so if you use some another evolutionary model maybe you can get some different type of curve okay now let us talk about the next model what we call it as the kimura two parameter model that was published in 1980 but before we talk about this model let us get introduced with two more terms that we will need in our discussion these are transition and transformation so you people might already be aware of this thing therefore i would just introduce you to uh, gain back to this concept okay so what happens is that in natural dna sequence we have two purines adenine and guanine we term as we term them as a and g and we have uh, two pyrimidines cytosine and thymine which we term the, which we term them as c and t these purines are uh, you can say uh, these are two ring uh, bases and we have two pyrimidines that are single ring bases okay so now transition is said to happen this transition is said to happen when one purine is substituted by another purine or one pyrimidine is substituted by another pyrimidine okay similarly when there is cross substitution between purines and pyrimidines we say that uh, transversions have occurred so in this in this particular figure the blue colored substitution is termed as transition while the red color substitution is termed as transversion well of course this image is taken from wikipedia well now it is observed that transitions happen more frequently as compared to transversion that is what people have observed that is the rate of transition is way much higher than the rate of transversion and hence it will be more logical if we provide different rate of substitution for transition and transversion it would be more logical if we have different rate of substitution for transition and another rate of substitution for transversion right so this is the very basic assumption in the kimura two parameter model based on this observation what these guys did is that they allowed differential rate of substitution for transition and transversion okay so if we allow differential rate for substitution of transition and transversion and build a, build another model that would be your kimura two parameter model that was proposed in 1980 and we sometime refer it to as k2p model okay so in jc69 we considered equal cost for all mutation well we'll say for example let me write it here jc69 what was the basic assumption equal cost for all mutation and we have referred it to as alpha okay in other words all mutation rate were considered to be happening at equal rate all mutations were considered to be happening at equal rate when it came to jc69 but this may not be true when it comes to actual dna sequences biological world prefers transition mutation over transversion mutation and hence they happen more frequently in dna in other words the observed rate of trans uh, transversion is higher than that of the observed rate of transition is higher than that of transversion 
therefore one can add another layer of complexity in our model by assigning one rate for transversion and another rate for transition this is exactly what kimura did in his k2p model right so this is the basic assumption so in order to implement this differential substitution for transition and transversion we might need to modify our transition rate matrix okay so let us draw me a simple transition rate matrix for you you can have a g c and t and the same a g c and t on the other way okay so uh, let us define alpha as rate of transition in this model we would define alpha as alpha as rate of transition and beta as rate of transversion let us call transition as ts in our future lecture and transversion as tv in our subsequent lecture okay so what we have done we have provided different rate alpha for transition and beta for transversion okay in short this k2p model assumes alpha for transition and beta for transversion hence the new transition uh, rate matrix in kt k2p model will look something like this we would we would have alpha over here and beta over here right over here we would have two betas right and we would have an alpha over here right over here you can have alpha this would be beta this would be beta based on what type of transition might have happened in this case you might have beta over here beta over here and in this case you might have alpha over here so now the diagonal terms are still remaining right so for each row we will have we will have a single alpha and we will have two betas right that is how transition and transversions are arranged in this transition rate matrix so since we have two separate rate of submission that is we have two betas and a single alpha in each row the diagonal substitution will be changed to simply 1 minus alpha minus minus 2 beta right why because we have single alpha and we have two beta therefore we have to subtract single alpha and twice beta from the uh, so that uh, we would get the uh, we would get the substitution for a to a right therefore we can also write it in a simpler word as minus alpha minus 2 beta right minus alpha minus 2 beta again minus alpha minus 2 beta and in this way you have the transition rate matrix for kimura 2 parameter model 1980 well now it is to be noted that in this k2p substitution model there is no change in the base frequency okay the assumption for the base frequency remain remains the same as it was in jc69 the assumption that all the nucleotide can show up in the sequence with equal frequency remains as it is in this model as well okay so what we have changed is only the rate of substitution rate of substitution for uh trans uh, transition and transversion has changed okay so since we have this transition rate matrix 
now we will have to derive the probability matrix okay so the next step that we need to do is to calculate the probability matrix for providing the time dimension in the calculation here there are changes in the exponent function that we use for generating the probability matrix well the exponent function will now become more complex right say for example i would uh, just uh, let you uh, let you uh, let you know what are the expressions that are involved in uh, calculation of the probabilities for transition probabilities for transversion right so for example for calculating transition probability or what we call it as alpha the transition the function or what we uh, what we call it as the probability function is something like this 1 minus e raised to alpha t okay so using this equation you can uh, you can again calculate the probability of transition that might happen in your uh, transition rate matrix right there is a separate exponent function for dealing the transversion process for transversion process that we have already defined it as beta this thing can be calculated by using expression 1 by 4 1 plus e raised to minus 4 alpha t minus 2 e raised to minus 2 alpha plus beta t right so this equation can be used for calculating the probability of transversion that happens in your Kimura two parameter model so once this is taken care of that is once uh, you are in position to calculate the transition probability and uh, transversion probability then the diagonal values are calculated based on the above two values okay so how is that now we calculate the diagonal value minus alpha minus 2 beta probability it is simply as 1 minus twice your transversion probability minus transition probability so using these three equation you can calculate all the 16 value in the probability matrix of Kimura two parameter model okay so uh, in this way you can finally get the probability matrix for k2p evolutionary model it will be way too complicated so let us not uh, draw it here again if you pay a very keen attention you would realize that this k2p evolutionary model depends on two factors that is the rate of substitution of transitions and transversion that is rate of substitution of transition what we have denoted as alpha and uh, rate of substitution of transversion that we have denoted by beta okay therefore this k2p parameter model is also referred to as two parameter model right so uh, your gc69 was one parameter model that was dependent only on single parameter alpha but here it is a two parameter model uh, which is dependent on two parameter alpha as well as beta 
So this is the difference between the JC69 and uh, K2P parameter model. Okay. So around the same time, Felsenstein uh, Felsin and his team started modifying the Jukes Cantor model in a different direction. Okay. So 1969, we had JC69 model. And when your K2P model was being developed, at the same time, this F81 model was also being developed by uh, Felsenstein. Okay, so uh, they but they uh, they uh, took some different direction, and they decided to change the base frequency as well. Right till now, only rate of substitution was changed in the previous two model. That is uh, K2P and JC69. We were only playing around with uh, uh, with changing uh, with uh, changing uh, what you can say uh, <coughs> uh, only we, we change only the rate of substitution right in the previous two model. But uh, Felsenstein, Felsenstein and his team well they decided to change the ba uh, the base frequencies as well. Till now, only rate of substitution was changed in the previous two model, but these guys now tried to incorporate another layer of complexity by including natural base frequency, right? So this decision was again made in the view of the fact that this base frequency may not remain exactly the same for all nucleotide bases in the DNA. Right. That is, all nucleotide bases may not be present in equal proportion. Their proportion may vary. Therefore, one more parameter was added in this model. Let us not go into the details of uh, uh, this model. Let us not uh, go into the mathematics of uh, this model and make your life more miserable. The point is that these guys didn't stop at two parameters and included another parameter to increase more complexity. That is what happened in uh, Felsenstein 81 model or F. 81 model. Well now, in this way, the modification really never stopped and every upcoming model was more complex mathematically than the previous and uh, these models are still improving, still improving. Let me just summarize the subsequent model and their main features and assumption. Going into mathematical details of each model is completely out of scope of this video series and maybe your exam syllabus as well, right? So numerous models of evolution have been created to account for various evolutionary scenarios, moving from very simple to way more complex uh, the models that are proposed recently, okay? So the very first model that was proposed was Jukes Cantor model what we call it as JC69 model that was proposed in 1969. It is the simplest model. They assume that equilibrium nucleotide frequencies are equal and that any nucleotide can change to any other nucleotide with equal probability. That is what their basic assumption was. What was their basic assumption? Assuming that equilibrium nucleotide frequency are always equal, right? And 
that any nucleotide can change into any other nucleotide with equal probability that is what the basic assumption of jukes kanter model was okay then later on kimura two parameter model came in what we call it as k2p model that happened in 1980 so what the, what these guys did these guys allowed for differences in transition and transver uh, transversion rates while they kept uh, base frequencies equal okay so this is what they did they allowed for differences in transition and transversion rates what we have termed it as alpha and beta while they kept base frequencies equal right then came f81 okay so this f81 allowed some bases to be more common than others while keeping the substitution probability is equal f81 assumes that base frequencies are similar across the sequences right so this is what they done they allowed some bases to be more common than others while they kept substitution probabilities equal okay so in this way f81 assumes that break base frequencies are similar across the sequences later on in 1985 another model was proposed called as hyk85 this model appeared in 1985 okay so uh, hasegawa kishino and yano proposed uh, this model in 1985 that combined features from f81 as well as k2p model they additionally considered this transition and a uh, transversion bias okay so now let me tell you in short as to what is this uh, transition and transversion bias okay they, they considered this transition and transversion bias in their model as well right so uh, this this hyk85 model considered feature from f81 as well as kimura parameter model and they introduced their own concept of transition and transversion bias okay so what is this transition and transversion bias well now it is said that it is observed that if we take transition and a transversion ratio between homologous strand of dna you will find that this ratio is generally about 2 that is this transition to transversion ratio is generally about 2 but things change when it comes to protein coding region this transition to transversion ratio typically get elevated when it comes to protein coding region in such protein coding region transversions are more likely to change the underlying amino acid substitution and thus possibility 
and thus possibly lead to a fatal mutation in the translated protein right and therefore there is difference in between this transition and transversion ratio when it comes to protein coding region let me rephrase it once more in protein coding region transversions are more likely to change the underlying amino acid uh, underlying amino acids and thus the possibility of fatal mutation increases in translated protein okay now this phenomenon is called as the transition bias we call it as the transition bias therefore hasegawa kishino and yono took the ratio of transition and transversion to account for this bias and proposed th the same in the hky 85 model later on in 1986 another model was proposed called as gtr model or what we call it as general time reversible model that was proposed in 1986 so this gtr model builds on this previously proposed hyk 85 by permitting each of the six substitution pair to have different rates in this case they kept each of the six substitution rate to have say some different values now you can just imagine how complicated the uh, transition rate matrix might become right so gtr contain the features of all the remaining model like hyk f81 kimura parameter model and jukes kenter model properly nested within it and this happened in 1986 okay so uh, let me again uh, revise everything that we have uh, uh, that we have uh, uh, discussed so far jc69 happened in 1969 based on this jc69 f uh, k2p model was proposed by allowing transition or transition uh, transition and transversion bias it was proposed in 1980 in 1981 felsenstein again modified the same jc69 model but they allowed the base frequencies to vary as well in 1985 hky 85 model was proposed that somehow incorporated the idea from all the previously generated model okay and finally in 1986 this uh, general time reversible model was published that allow different rate uh, between all six pairs of nucleotide changes and eventually uh, that led to proposal of this uh, gtr model right uh, but the thing is that uh, things uh, the story didn't end in 1986 okay so somewhere in the middle other variants of models were also reported well say for example Felsenstein again uh, you know uh, they they modified their F81 model and they proposed this F84 model in early 1990s okay and this F84 was essentially similar to F81 model but they involved maximum likely root calculation and this and, and they term it as f84 model right so the kimura two parameter model was later on extended to generate tn92 model that was proposed by temura in 1992 okay so this tn92 model is uh, you know is to be generally used when there is strong transition to 
transversion bias and the g g plus c content bias is very high okay so th this g plus c bias were observed in drosophila mitochondrial dna and based on this observation then timura in 1992 Uh, extended the K2P model and they propose TN92 model. This model was again remodeled to TN93 by Tamura and Ni in 1993. Okay, so what what is that uh, happened in uh, this model? Is that this model distinguish between two different type of transition? They made a separate distinction between what happens between A and G is different than what happens when C is replaced by T. Okay, that is the two different type of transition A to G is allowed uh, to have different rate than C to T. this was have this this was allowed to have say some different rate and c to t uh, substitution was allowed to have some different rate right so but in case of transversion transversion here were assume to occur at same rate and based on this model tn92 model was again uh, evolved in tn93 model right so this gtr model was proposed by taveri et al in 1986 right so in this way you know things never stopped each and every time people tried to incorporate some new assumption some new feature in their model and uh, each and every model does is uh, you know uh, multi parameter model new parameters were added right so each and every model has got its own unique assumptions and therefore they have got their uh, each and uh, each and every model has got its own pros and cons well let us not go there so with uh, this summary let us conclude our video here what we tried here was to sum up various evolutionary model that are uh, present in the next video we will focus on selection of an appropriate model for your data set right so in our next lecture we would uh, try to address an issue as to there are now different evolutionary model that i have already explained starting from the simplest one that was proposed in 1969 to some of the latest one uh, that i stretch till 1993 so based on these various model which one should i prefer that might be the another daunting question that might uh, uh, that might pop up in your heads right now right so we would deal with uh, this aspect of as to which model should i prefer when i perform this phylogenetic analysis we would talk about uh, this aspect in our next lecture so thank you guys for your kind attention see you in our next video lecture